All right, may I uh, convene us for our uh, three o'clock uh, panel session and uh, welcome to those we're seeing for the first time. Welcome back to those we uh, saw earlier for our earlier sessions, which I think were really, uh, really excellent. Uh, this afternoon, um, I, I should introduce myself, I'm Michael Johnston, uh, formerly of Colgate University. Um, I'm joined by a distinguished panel I'll introduce in uh, just a moment. Uh, this afternoon, we're taking up three of the most important and three of the most challenging cases of both corruption and authoritarianism with an added set of riddles involving uh, political change, its uh, sources, its consequences, and the like. So you know, I am particularly looking forward to uh, the discussions to come. Uh, we'll go in the order that uh, was listed on the program. We'll begin with Hannah Chapman, who is the Romanov Assistant Professor of Russian Studies in the Department of International and Area Studies here at the University of Oklahoma, who will be talking about Russia. Uh, we'll then move to Professor Mitchell Smith, Department of International and Area Studies and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, College of International Studies here at University of Oklahoma, uh, whose uh, focus will be Hungary. And uh, finally, Scott Fritzen, uh, my friend and co-author, uh, sitting to my left, the uh, a professor of international and area studies and the dean of the College of International Studies and our host at, uh, at this event here at the University of Oklahoma with a focus on China. We will aim for about 12 minutes for presentation with the idea that uh, uh, perhaps uh, there will be some uh, overrun for that and then we'll have uh, questions and answers. And I want to particularly urge and invite students uh, student questions. Uh, some of your professors will be here. They aren't grading you, but uh, they will certainly be happy to hear from uh, you. So. <laughs> <laughs> call that uh, call that a, a system of incentives. So I'll uh, be, be delighted to hear from uh, students in the Q and A. So uh, let's begin with uh, Professor Chapman uh, in a discussion of authoritarianism and kleptocracy in Putin's Russia. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited about this turnout. Thank you all very much for coming. I was talking a bit with my panelists uh, in advance of our session today. And I was saying, today you're going to help me process some of my most recent emotions about events going on in Russia. Um, so hopefully we can walk through some of the ways in which authoritarianism and corruption go hand in hand in the country today. So, but before we get to Russia, I always think it's important to take a quick step back to understand a bit more about how authoritarian regimes actually work in practice. And so typically, and my grad students here will know, we've talked about this a lot, when we think about how authoritarian regimes stay in power, we typically think of them as having to appease two groups. The first being the masses, just ordinary people like you and me, who have the potential to go out on the streets and protest their governments and their leaders should they not be happy with how things are going on in their country. And then the second group that authoritarian leaders have to consider are the elite, our potential challengers, high level political and economic individuals who have the capability of staging a coup and throwing out the leader in power should they be unhappy with how the country is going. So today, because the question is about how authoritarianism and corruption, I am going to be focusing specifically on the second group, on the elite, and looking at how the Putin regime in Russia tries to reduce threats and gain the loyalty of these individuals. And you might guess that the way that they do this is indeed through corruption. So in Russia, corruption has become such a key part of how political, the political system actually functions that is frequently referred to what we call a kleptocracy. And a kleptocracy just refers to a system of government whose leaders use their power and for their own personal and political gain. There's a fantastic book that is written specifically on this topic called Putin's Kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia by Karen Duisha. If you're interested in this topic, please go read it. It is utterly fascinating. And we call Russia a kleptocracy because corruption is not a bug in its political system. Rather, it's a feature of that system. 
And what I mean by that is corruption is one of the ways that the Putin regime has managed to stay in power for over 20 years now. Now, I wanna be clear, corruption did not start with the Putin regime. It will not end with the Putin regime. But Russia is a personalistic regime where power is concentrated in the hands of one individual, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, and he's been a very savvy user of corruption for staying in power. So let me show you what I mean by that. So when Putin first came to power in 2000, he inherited a country that was in the midst of a very serious economic recession and a political system that had a weak central government. So the first thing he had to do when he came in power was to deal with these issues. And the way that he did so is he focused on consolidating power in the hands of the presidency during his early years. The way he did so is focusing on reestablishing what we call the power vertical, which just means strengthening the central government at the expense of regional and local governments. And so he did this through a number of ways, such as bringing regional governors under his thumb by replacing direct election of governors with appointment by the president. So now, if you were a governor and you wanted to continue to be a governor, you had to uh, pledge your loyalty to the new regime um, and allow the regime to use your political machines to uh, stay in power themselves. And then secondly, and most important for our purposes today, he sought to gain control over the oligarchs, that is the economic elite that had gained very significant political and economic power and influence during his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin's presidency. And he did so by offering what we now call the grand bargain. And the grand bargain is actually quite simple. It says that the Kremlin would allow oligarchs to retain all of their assets, their yachts, their mansions, their really uh, large businesses, and would provide them with access to state institutions and resources, which would allow them to keep their wealth. And in exchange for all of these goodies and this fabulous lifestyle, the oligarchs pledged to stay loyal to Putin specifically and his regime more general and would align themselves with this new system. Moreover, and very importantly, they would promise to stay out of politics. And this will become important later on. Those that did not agree to this grand bargain, such as the three gentlemen on your screen, this is Boris Berezovsky, Vladimir Guzinski, and uh, Mikhail Korakovsky, became targets of persecution. Berezovsky, up in the right-hand corner there, was found dead under mysterious circumstances. Kordakovsky ended up spending about 14 years in prison. All three of these individuals who at that, the time when Putin came into power were leaders of some of Russia's most important natural resources and um, media conglomerates, uh, had their businesses renationalized and under, um, brought under the leadership of people who were close to Putin. So these people and some other oligarchs were used as examples to others with a lot of um, political and economic sway to show them what could potentially happen should they not choose to fall in line. And a lot of people were quite amenable to this deal. The number of billionaires in Russia on Forbes list went from just eight in 2001 all the way to 87 in just 2008, only a few years there. So worked out quite well for a number of people. And so this kind of like backdoor dealings has been a really critical part of allowing Putin to maintain his power because Putin himself serves as both a guarantor of elite wealth and survival. There's a fantastic quote um, by an active Russian journalist and activist, Ali Akashin, which I think sums up this relationship quite nicely. And he says, they traded in their rights as political agents for those very yachts and villas that I previously talked about. But the elites, hamstrung by their dependence on power for wealth and security, find themselves in no position to say no to Mr. Putin. So being loyal to the government, being loyal to the people in power, gives them a license to steal the resources of the state. It opens up unimaginable wealth and opportunity. So the two mansions you see on the screen here, the one at the top is uh, that of Sergei Shoigu, um, Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, and at the bottom, Putin's spokesperson. Not exactly something you think that you could buy on a civil servant's salary, right? 
perhaps a little bit too much. And so in return for all of this wealth, Putin gains this lo the loyalty of these key economic, political, and security actors, which allow him to then stabilize his authoritarian rule. And so this is how corruption and authoritarianism go hand in hand in Russia, right? On one hand, corruption has guaranteed Putin the political and economic power needed to consolidate Russia into an authoritarian regime. And on the other hand, authoritarianism has given the regime the power that they need to dole out state resources to loyalists. However, just as corruption is a key source of Russia's authoritarian control, so too does its very nature implant seeds of its own weakness. Corruption is not just all of a, a good for the country. It also has a lot of weaknesses. And there are two main reasons for this. First, corruption is inherently a balancing act. If we go back to the earliest part of the presentation, I told you that authoritarian regimes have to satisfy two groups, the elites, but also the masses. So while corruption is a way to guarantee elite loyalty, it also limits the available resources that are available to appease ordinary people. Right? This, is, this is quite intuitive in some ways. So if your state revenue is going into the pockets of your cronies, into the pockets of your loyalists, it means it's not being spent on the country. It's not being spent on infrastructure, on education, pensions, salaries, all of the things that you need and that are essential to keeping people, ordinary people, satisfied with the government and happy that it is in power. So the more that you use corruption to satisfy elites, the harder it becomes then to satisfy this other group, the masses. And so this is why corruption is inherently unstable. Second, authoritarian regimes like Russia suffer from information problems. And the students in here who are in my class are quite familiar with this. Because power in Russia is concentrated in a single individual, and because pleasing that individual is such an important part of staying in, in power and in favor over time, the people who are surrounding the leader become less and less willing to tell that leader um, what he, and it's usually a he, want to, don't want to hear because they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to fall out of favor. And we're seeing this very clearly right now in the case of Ukraine. So when uh, Russia first invaded Ukraine on February 24th, they called this a three-day operation. It is now September, the end of September. More than three days have passed, right? And it seemed very clear right now that Putin thought that the invasion of Ukraine would be very quick and easy. That Russia could go in, be hailed as liberators, take over parts of the country, get rid of the government, and be done with it in about three days, right? Why do they believe this? Why does it seem to be that the government actually thought that this was going to happen? Something that we see is not really on, um, have any reality on the ground. And a large part is for this is that over time, there have been fewer and fewer moderates within Putin's inner circle who would have been giving him the information that probably this isn't going to go over quite how you like. And I think this is exhibited quite clearly in, if any of you guys heard of the long table jokes here with Putin, right? So Putin over here on one corner of this very, very long table, and then all of his uh, advisors sitting way, way, way far at the end. That's kind of a great metaphor for what's going on. So rather than being surrounded by the more moderate members of his elites who would be more likely to temper these types of uh, actions, he's instead being surrounded primarily by hawkish hardliners, by members of the security services, who have supported very strongly uh, aggressive actions and moves like the war in Ukraine. So the people surrounding Putin shrink over time. So he's received some bad information, which has led and ended up with Russia being embroiled in a very long military campaign that they were clearly not prepared to undertake. So these are the two ways in which corruption can weaken authoritarian regimes and make it difficult for them to stay in power in the long term. So the number one question I then get asked is always, given these weaknesses, given the problems with corruption, what are the prospects for regime change? Is there any potential for this? You all remember President Biden's really famous quote by, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. 
So what are the chances of something happening? Um, my, unfortunately, I, it's kind of a depressing answer. Is there a chance of a regime change in Russia, barring perhaps Putin's death? At this point, the answer appears probably not. So the international community has increased sanctions dramatically, specifically in order to put pressure on elites and encourage them to stage a coup that would out Putin and put in a hopefully more moderate regime. But I am skeptical about whether or not this is likely to work. So the economic elite, the oligarchs that are most likely to be hurt by sanctions, have limited political power due to this grand bargain that they reached with Putin early on in his tenure, the grand bargain I talked about earlier. Furthermore, while the metaphorical pie, the goodies that are available to them has shrunk, they risk losing any slice of the pie whatsoever should Putin be removed and replaced with somebody else, right? And so for that reason, the oligarchs, the people most hit by international sanctions in the international community, are not likely to try to go then and stage a coup. Moreover, the elites that continue to remain with a lot of influence in Russia, these hardliners, are the ones that are most likely to support the war in the first place. Right? So the second option would be, what are the prospects for mass uprising? Right? Unfortunately, I don't see much there either. So while in the past couple of years, the Kremlin has increased the use of repression, making it really, really difficult for people to go out and protest on the street, essentially decimating any oppositional organizations. While some recent events, so if you all had heard yesterday, um, Putin made a call for mobilization, which would call up between 300,000 and some speculate up to a million people to go fight with the war in Ukraine. While this is likely to be very unpopular, it still is not clear that they would have the momentum to actually lead to any actual change. But at the same time, one of the difficulties with uh, studying authoritarian regimes is it's really hard to know exactly what's going on within the regimes themselves. So as the, uh, as the fall of the Soviet Union and the Arab Spring showed us, authoritarian regimes very often look stable right up until the point they are not, right? So the same steps that Putin has taken to control the narrative in Russia and to control the people around him make it much harder for him to know what people are thinking. What are his elites who are out of favor thinking? What are people on the ground thinking? So if something were to actually happen, we probably wouldn't see it until it did. Um, so I think I'm out of time, so I will end with that. But I'm really excited. If there's a lot going on, I'm happy to talk about a lot of things. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. So Professor Mitchell Smith, and thank you very much for stimulating. Depressing, <laughs> what's most going likely. Well, yes. <laughs> So thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to share this panel with my colleagues from in the College of International Studies. Thank you all for being here. I really look forward to the discussion. There's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, the case of Hungary is absolutely fascinating for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is there's actually a good deal of similarity with the case of Russia. And in fact, there's conscious borrowing from Russia. I mean, and some of those similarities involve the expenditure of funds to uh, create a, a, a an environment of, of cronyism and, uh, and loyalty. Um, but there's another interesting dimension. Before I, I go any further, I'm going to set an alarm to hold myself publicly accountable. And when it goes off, I have three minutes to finish. So everybody will know that I have to stop in three minutes. So um, it's also a case, Hungary, of, of, of a very clear autocracy corruption uh, nexus. But what's especially fascinating in this case um, has to do with the fact that Hungary, as a member of the European Union, is part of an entity that places the highest value on democracy, rule of law, uh, democracy and rule of law. And Hungary, when it became a member in 2004, had to meet a series of criteria that were very detailed in order to become a member of the European Union. And it had basically um, transformed itself from within to shed some aspects of its communist past to become a democratic country in which democracy seemed to be 
you know, firmly, uh, the country seemed to be firmly moored at the harbor of democracy, but it has drifted from those, those moorings. And that's what's especially interesting about this, um, this case. And I'm probably also not going to know how to even advance my slides. There we go. Okay. So to start with, um, Freedom House, which scores countries on issues of um, political and civil rights, things like electoral pluralism, associational rights, media freedom go into this calculation, uh, has really um, fallen dramatically in the last uh, decade or so uh, under the, the leadership of Viktor, Viktor Orban, who has been there since 2010 as the leader. He just won his, his fourth uh, electoral victory. I'll come back to that. And Hungary, with a score of 69 out of 100, is the only partly free, that is not fully free country in the European Union. Um, note that I put the United States in there, down at 83. That may be surprising to some. The U.S. has also sunk dramatically. And it also turns out that there is a, a, a concerted effort in the United States on the part of substantial political forces to borrow from the Hungarian model. So that's something to keep in mind. So I talked about Hungary as being a member of the European Union. Back in 2018, the European Parliament, I don't expect you to read uh, all the details of this slide, but the European Parliament began to the first step in invoking a procedure to call uh, Hungarian democracy to account and to, to insist on some changes. And um, you could see some of the things that the Parliament cited in, in safeguarding democracy in the European Union, that there were violations of freedom of expression, of academic freedom, um, privacy and data protection, corruption, independence of the judiciary, and, and more has been added in the time since. Um, and so uh, Hungary has really become uh, a violator uh, of democratic, I mean, it's even more than a violator of democratic norms. It has become an autocracy within the European Union. Um, just to give you some examples of things that have gone on, and there are many, many examples. Um, Hungary built a border fence with um, Serbia and Croatia. Croatia was not a member of the European Union at the time, um, but uh, this was to keep uh, refugees out, and Hungary has a, a, a dismal record on its uh, treatment of refugees. Um, and has kept them out. Um, in addition to all of the ways in which Viktor Orban has um, gained control of political institutions throughout the country, the media, um, the judiciary, the political system, the electoral system, um, even with all of those things in place, one of the things that happens is Fidesz, the, the governing party led by Orban, actually creates bogus parties to run in elections to divide the opposition vote. So their bases are covered all around. They're not going to lose elections. By the way, this is something like in my European Union class, students sometimes say when we have this discussion, isn't it up to the people of Hungary to vote um, this party out? Well, the answer is, um, if that were possible, and the fact is that with the government completely controlling the media, controlling the electoral institutions, controlling all, all sorts of institutions, limiting the behavior and, and operations of um, non-governmental organizations, there's really not an opportunity to defeat the, the party electorally. There's a great podcast on this in the, the, in the This American Life series from uh, back in the spring when the election took place, uh, the last election took place in Hungary, I think it, this was early April. Um, where the leader of the opposition, who had united all of the opposition parties against Orban, and there was some hope that Orban might def be defeated, talked about the fact that he got five minutes, five minutes of time, of public uh, airtime to campaign throughout the entire course of the electoral process. So completely dominated by uh, Orban and his supporters. So the, 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 the place uh, where the European Union comes directly into this has to do with funding. The European Union provides very significant funds to bring countries, particularly countries that when they joined the European Union were somewhat um, poorer than the EU average, very substantial development funds. And for the, the budget for Hungary for this period of 2014 to 20, this is a, the, the EU does a, a budget for that length of time, um, and they're, the, they're now in the next budget cycle, 32 billion euros. Note that of that total budget, but less than 5 billion was national, the rest came from the European Union. So massive funding from the European Union, and this is funding for things like infrastructure investment, research and development, vocational training, um, climate change adaptation, many, many things that it goes for. 
And so you have an enormous sum of money pouring into the country. Um, and this gives you an idea of the funds pouring in annually on a per capita basis. Something on the order of, depending on the exchange rate you use, $2,500 to $3,000 per person per year. That is a huge amount of money to flow through a, a government. Um, and here's the paradox of this, what we could call the subsidy paradox. These funds are meant to anchor Hungary in democracy, rule of law, economic development, to bring it up closer to the average level of, of economic uh, well-being in, in the European Union. And in fact, economically speaking, the funds have done that. There's been enormous progress in Hungary in that sense. Yet, that very same funding has financed autocracy and made the strengthening of a, the, the, the construction and strengthening of autocracy possible. How has it done so? Um, let me just give you a few examples. This is just a, a photo to give you an idea of, of agricultural lands that have been distributed almost exclusively to um, uh, or Orban's supporters. The, the person named in, the, in this particular photo um, happens to have been a childhood friend of his, but lots of, uh, of, of land has gone to um, his son-in-law, friends of his son-in-law, his daughter, um, his father, uh, other people in his close circle that are loyalists and have supported uh, his, his regime. Um, and so, um, you know, here's another just a, you know, from an article about this, about, about how Orban is using European tax mayor money to bankroll his friends and family. It refers to Lake Balotan, which is the, um, I think it's the largest freshwater body in Central Europe. And there's a huge, Euro, there are European Union funds available for um, sort of resort development as a regional development project. And all of the um, contracts to develop have gone to Orban's supporters. This gives you an idea. Just shows you when, when Orban became, came into power in 2010, notice the huge increase in the, um, um, the, the, the share of, of public contracts awarded to his loyal supporters. It's just skyrocketed. And most, you know, this is, this is European Union money. So the taxpayers of the European Union are funding Orban's uh, project of building a loyal follower of corrupt uh, cronies to support his autocracy. How does he support that autocracy? Through fear. And it, it, it's, it's kind of a neo-fear. Neo um, an institutional fear. It's not the kind of fear that we'd associate with, um, let's say, the, you know, the old Soviet Union, where people would you know, be sent off to prison or disappear, or, or I suppose um, Putin's Russia today, it, you know, the same thing happens. But it's, you know, if you're a farmer that, that starts to complain about the fact that, that, some, that others around you are, are, are buying up all the land, and you didn't even know if it was for sale, if there was a public tender, and you were just completely closed out of it, um, if you start to complain too loudly, Inspectors will show up at your farm and say, hmm, we hear that the water on your farm doesn't meet standards for you to continue farming. We better test it. And you become harassed in that fashion. So um, what is the EU you know, doing about this, an entity that supposedly stands for democracy and rule of law? Um, the, the argument that I want to make in the, the, the few minutes that I have remaining, and I'm checking on how much time I have left. I still have about total about six and a half minutes. Um, is that the struggle is completely asymmetrical. And it's asymmetrical for these reasons. Number one, many of the decisions that the European Union makes have to be done unanimously. I will give you an example of that. Um, Fidesz, Orban's party, played an important role in helping the European People's Party, which is the, the sort of center right in the European Parliament, keep its majority and win votes. And so he played his hand very um, uh, uh, cleverly and, and kept the support of the European People's Party, particularly the German uh, delegation, which is the largest delegation. Um, he also developed very close relations with the German government. I'll talk about that. Um, and so they needed Fidesz, and they didn't, it was only recently that they suspended Fidesz from membership. Um, the EU is committed to rule of law. There's an asymmetry. We see this in the United States today. When one party is committed to the rule of law and following the rules, and another party says, I don't care about the rules, I care about power, there is an asymmetry there. The EU also um, exercises deference to national governments. It's just part of the way it is uh, uh, constituted. And the consequence of that is that Orban has been able to get away with a lot. And finally, 
um, this is sort of my formulation of this, of this point, that there is a disjuncture between the means of integration that reside at the European level with the European Union institutions and the means of socialization, which are controlled largely locally and nationally. In other words, you know, just as in Putin's Russia, he can saturate the country with propaganda and shape what people think, Orban has very much done the same thing, the same thing in Hungary. And it's not that the Hungarian people are all brainwashed. Um, what has happened is the country is deeply divided. Um, a lot of young people have left the country because they don't like what's going on. Um, and this is, you know, from the standpoint of maintaining autocracy, not a bad thing. I mean, there's the danger that you, you, you lose young, talented people, but you maintain the autocracy if those who oppose it leave. So uh, on the issue of unanimity, I'll just give you some examples of each of these things. Uh, and I could tell you I'm going to run out of time, but I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly after this. Um, Hungary, there, so the European Union, you know, bounced back from the, the COVID pandemic, uh, emerging from it, and came up with a plan to invest very heavily in all the member states in economic recovery, very oriented toward um, green technology and, and, and uh, economic renewal as a consequence. Well, they needed unanimous support to pass this legislation. Hungary threatened to veto it and held it hostage. Um, I talked about close relations with the German government. There are very, lots of very large German companies that, have heavy, that are heavily invested in Hungary and making a lot of money there, and Orban makes sure that they're treated well. And therefore, when Angela Merkel was the German chancellor, he maintained very positive relations with her. The current German government is less favorably inclined toward him and is, and is now beginning to call him to account, along with the European Parliament and other leaders. So things are, are changing. The EU's commitment to rule of law. Um, so in uh, December of 2020, the European Union finally agreed on a mechanism to punish wayward governments that violate a rule of law and withhold some of the funds that were going to them on that basis. But Hungary and Poland challenged this in court. The European Union said, okay, that's my three minute warning. The, 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 uh, the, the European Union institutions, the European Commission said, okay, we'll wait for the court ruling before we do anything. That delayed things. In February of 2000, February of this year, the court ruled that Hungary and that the challenge from Hungary and Poland was did not uh, was not well grounded. They dismissed it um, in its entirety, as this says here. Um, and the court said the European Union budget is one of the principal instruments for giving practical effect to the fundamental principle of solidarity between member states. So uh, a really solid ruling that gave the institutions of the EU kind of the green light to go ahead and be, and begin to withhold funds on rule of law grounds. Um, this just gives you some examples of the response from Poland and Hungary, more of the same sort, sorts of things. All along, Orban has been very effective in using the European Union as a foil and saying um, the European Union is, you know, they're, they're trying to dictate to us. And he's used it to strengthen, this is the, what, what I mean when I refer to um, the means of socialization at the national level. They are the, the, the globalist elites of France and Germany are trying to dictate to us. They're trying to change our national identity. I am the defender of that identity, and you need me for that reason. Um, but, you know, the justice minister in Hungary and Poland, they dismiss all what the European Union is doing as heavily political. Um, again, more deference to national governments. Um, the European Union institution said, we won't act until after the election in Hungary. The election took place. The European Parliament immediately decreed that the Hungarian government is no longer a full democracy. There have been anti-fraud investigations. Again, deference to national governments. What happens when Olaf, the, the European Anti-Fraud Office, finds that Hungary has engaged in all of these violations? Well, um, two things. Number one, what Olaf does is identify the violations, and then it's up to the national governments to do something about them. And um, Orban just has a, you know, a, a lock grip on the system, and they basically dismiss all of these charges and say, you know, we are building a, what he calls a system of national cooperation, which means we need to have a class of national industrialists loyal to the mission of protecting Hungary's national identity. And so it's a legitimate thing to do, and you can't tell us otherwise. Um, so rejecting you know, any action on, on the fraud. Um, more examples of socialization and anti-Soros campaign, which is inherently anti-Semitic, but also anti-Soros. 
when, when he says anti-globalist, it's also anti-Semitic. Um, these are pro-Orban protests. I do not, I don't speak Hungarian, so disclaimer, but, but some of, you know, some of the, 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 the posters here say things like, never again, referring to 1956 under Soviet domination. And, and some, of, you know, some of that is a thinly veiled way of saying we're not going to be dominated by the European Union either. And Orban is, plays on that all the time. I'm out of time, but I'll just finish with uh, a couple of sentences, which are that the Europe, and I'm happy to talk about this more in the discussion. The European Union has a mechanism for dealing with wayward countries, but it's a very cumbersome mechanism that's very difficult to enact. And you know, that's what all of this tells you. Um, and it's been, they've really not gotten very far with it. The fundamental mistake of the EU institutions in devising all of this was the assumption that once um, moored in the, at the, in the democratic harbor, countries are unlikely to drift away. That was the first mistake. And the second mistake was that if this happens, it will happen to one country. It won't happen to multiple countries, as has happened, Hungary, Poland, and others. Czech Republic has gone in this direction as well, to some extent, not nobody as far as Hungary. Um, and finally, that once we do things, like point out to a government, here are instances of fraud in your use of European Union funds, that the government will want to do something about it. Or you're drifting from rule of law in these ways, that the government will say, OK, we're going to you know, work to get back in line. Hungary has been completely unresponsive to these things because Orban is deliberately building this national project, and very successfully so. He just won his fourth election. So, where we are is this, this measure to try and withhold funds, and I think it is finally going to happen. There is, there is a lot of support for it within the EU institutions and the other member state governments. And so one, Politico Europe concludes that Orban should brace for impact. I'm not so sure yet, but perhaps that will be the outcome. Thanks. Fascinating discussion, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Smith. Uh, finally, we turn to uh, Scott Fritzen, our uh, professor and dean and host, and uh, he is going to take up the, uh, the easy and simple case of China. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So thank you very much. Given population size, I only claim twice the amount of time that everybody... <laughs> So the title is Authoritarian Corruption or Authoritarian Anti-Corruption, China under Xi Jinping. And the title refers to a very widespread and a widely discussed anti-corruption uh, campaign, crackdown that has been rolling on in China for over 10 years now. But let me start with a story. In 2009, I was in Singapore at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, teaching a seminar on anti-corruption policy making for a group of officials from Kazakhstan. And in the middle of showing them this slide, which came from a World Bank publication, uh, and basically shows a standard idea of restraining the executive as an anti-corruption strategy, a participant raised his hand and said, but Professor Fritzen, uh, this is all very well and good, but we've come from Kazakhstan to learn the Singapore model for fighting corruption. And our understanding of the Singapore model is that uh, the arrows don't point from, the from these checks to the executive, but in the opposite direction. And that's very good because our president is a great man. <laughs> and he has the best intentions for transforming the country. I was a little stumped on that one. And it's taken me only 12, 13 years to come to grips with it. But uh, fast forward, and just last year, Christopher Carruthers um, published a book called Corruption Control and Authoritarian Regimes, and another called Taking Authoritarian Anti-Corruption Seriously, in which the following points were asserted. Authoritarian regimes combat corruption, uh, and that's more common than is widely thought. And they succeed in overcoming challenges by using their particular authoritarian strengths, not by using their, by becoming more like democracies. And the book further claims that Xi's wide-ranging multi-year anti-corruption campaign is a successful reform, which is attributed to three key characteristics, power centralization, top-down control and penetration, and regime propaganda which has shut out independent media and public activism and allowed the campaign to proceed 
uh, in a very coherent way. So that's a very provocative point of view, and I thought I would take it on in this presentation, because the alternative point of view is power in China corrupts, and absolute power wielded by Xi Jinping corrupts absolutely. Um, and that's what we're more used to. So if you look at uh, certain indices, uh, for example, this one is of electoral democracy in 2021. It shows that under this particular index, uh, based on ourworldindata.org, um, China is ranks literally at the bottom of the world scale in terms of democracy and democratic institutions. A more complicated set of indices from the Bertelsmann Foundation, the, the BTI, so-called, in 2022, lists, as you can see here, political participation, rule of law, stability of democratic institutions in that upper uh, left-hand quadrant as being extremely low in contrast to economic performance and statements, stateness, uh, what is called. And all of this, uh, from a more nuanced point of view, goes to a set of characteristics about, uh, regarding authoritarianism in China. It is, of course, a one-party state in which centralized party leadership controls a thoroughgoing appointment process, including in the state sector, including in the state-dominated economic sector, even including in universities, where party officials uh, occupy parallel positions next to university presidents in a supervisory mechanism. The other characteristic, though, of authoritarianism in China that has been widely remarked upon is its so-called decentralized uh, character. Now, the, the basic idea here in the literature is that the central government is able to achieve some transformational economic um, targets by constructing performance measures that local cadres are held accountable for achieving while allowing flexibility in the means to achieve them, uh, but by relentlessly tying appointments and promotions to how local officials do on centrally determined targets, such as growth in local economic output. And that many analysts uh, have noted that this is a coherent and surprisingly successful scheme, and the economic transformation of China uh, suggests that that may be true. Another characteristic that we're seeing is under Xi Jinping, an increase in central control and enforcement of orthodoxy across a broad range of uh, sectors, uh, including widespread surveillance of public opinion. Not that it's new, but that it has increased and has been accentuated even further in the Xi Jinping era. What has been called digital authoritarianism is at an all-time high, and you certainly have seen a contraction of civil society space. Fledgling though it was in the 2000s, it has receded uh, further. And all of the many, uh, act, many analysts point to the strong ability, nevertheless, for the state to mobilize and shape public opinion with legitimacy fundamentally being quite high in the Chinese context, but linked tightly to the notion of sustained economic performance and that transformative academic, uh, economic perspective uh, that uh, China has continued to deliver, but which makes the legitimacy a fragile proposition. Two books separated at about 10 years apart point, you know, even in their titles and their, their graphics, to a central paradox of corruption and authoritarianism as a nexus in China. Double paradox, rapid growth with rising corruption. How do you explain that? Corruption is supposed to kill growth. It certainly hasn't done so in the Chinese context. Um, the basic notion of corruption in, in China, according to book length and, and elaborate uh, analyses, uh, is that corruption grew up from within the economic reform movement and fed off of it, uh, and it was a negative phenomenon. It detracted from growth, but not so much so as to kill that growth. In other words, growth, it was not growth facilitating. Uh, very few people are claiming that corruption helped China to grow economically. Uh, but the best analyses that I've come across suggest that uh, 
you know, periodic crackdowns have assisted in keeping corruption under control and keeping the growth manageable, uh, uh, churning on. Uh, but that uh, increasingly we see a shifting pattern towards uh, what uh, Ang calls access money, uh, meaning essentially the elite cartels and, and uh, competition that uh, Professor Johnston was referring to this morning, uh, really setting in in the Chinese context. And in areas such as uh, land transactions and preferential finance, you would have dense linkages between party and economic actors in which large amounts of state largesse and the authority to purchase land in haphazard uh, transactions that don't uh, are not subject to transparency um, have they lead to very high corruption potential even as they can drive economic transformation of the economy so if you have one story talking about uh, China is corrupt because it's authoritarian, and another saying that its uh, anti-corruption drive is so successful because it is authoritarian, which side is right? Well, my assessment uh, focuses on three points. First, I would say China's anti-corruption drive is in fact meaningful in its sustained scale and effects. I mean, take a look. There have been several million party officials disciplined in the past 10 years. Uh, these represent, this is a, an, a, an internally reported headcount of cases that, uh, I, that have been tallied up, but it amounts to really a widespread crackdown. There is no question about it. And when you get to, you know, if these are the flies, so-called, uh, the widespread cases that are being at the grassroots that are being um, cracked down upon, the so-called tigers have also been inventoried, and the list runs into the hundreds. Uh, in one list uh, that was published in 2017, um, a three, four-year period produced some 116 officials at the level of vice governor or above. Um, you can take a quick look here at, uh, for what they were accused of. Uh, poor Yi Jun. Ching was, uh, was uh, <laughs> caught on adultery. <laughs> that must be an interesting um, case. But most of the others on bribery in various sectors. And then there's a whole different list that, again, runs into the hundreds of members of the armed forces, leadership in the armed forces, that have experienced a uh, crackdown, uh, suspended death sentences, um, life sentences, um, and various kinds of disciplinary action. This one runs to 116 uh, senior members of the armed forces. So again, going back to my point, I do believe that uh, the anti-corruption drive has been meaningful. When you drill down, when you actually look at accounts of what's happening on the ground, people talk about this changing incentives uh, in certain areas of public official behavior, such as how you spend money at banquets is an often cited case. Um, there is real fear that, this crack, that you can get caught up in this crackdown. Um, and the cases that have been reported suggest these are, this is not a witch hunt. These are real cases in, in, most, in many cases. These are uh, real cases of corruption uh, being uh, caught up in enforcement. So going back to Carruthers' definition of successful reform, now the reason he called this successful is because his definition focuses largely on enforcement. In fact, he defines successful reform as one that leads to at least a 50% surge in corruption-related investigations and that reaches more than 0.01% uh, percent of all public officials and bureaucrats in a, in a country, and that imposes real significant penalties. So by that definition, I think this is a meaningful campaign, and I think Carruthers is onto something, and he's not alone. Uh, many people have, have noted this is a real anti-corruption crackdown. On the other hand, oh, sorry, I, one more point on the pro side. Um, the question has been asked, how do you assess the political will behind this campaign? Well, looking into it, I believe you can assess multiple motivations at stake. One is a power vertical Chinese style. <laughs> so I was glad that you brought in that term from the Russian context. There is definitely selectivity that observers have noted in the tigers uh, 
that have been targeted. Uh, none of the people who came up with Xi Jinping uh, over several years appear to have been, none of the top people appear to have been targeted in this. Uh, so there is a sense in which this could be a consolidation of, per, of political power in the Xi Jinping era. In addition, I believe it certainly has something to do with disciplining and gaining greater control over a sprawling party apparatus that, that um, you know, extends into the millions of members. Um, and it shapes a narrative of legitimacy, action, clean and powerful internal hand of government policing uh, the rest. Uh, and if I could just jump forward, um, my co-author, who's also just by coincidence named Fritzen, uh, <laughs> who's sitting in the audience, uh, my co-author and I have been working on a paper that looks at the narratives around corruption control um, and how they're portrayed in the Chinese press. And you can think of a, a framework in which corruption in these narratives in the Chinese press could be portrayed as either isolated cases or widespread. And on the other hand, if they are reaching core levels of power, like senior officials, core institutions, or whether they are located, these examples that are being reported in the press are on the periphery or lower level. And a third distinction, which is that diagonal you see across all of them, is, is justice shown to be served in these cases when you report them? You know, do you report on the execution of the corrupt of official, or do you leave it hanging, as in, we have a serious corruption problem here, and it's really hard to get our hands around it, and nobody's done anything about it? Perhaps not surprisingly, um, it's that last point that we found really predominates in the framing of the newspaper articles. That is justice being served. So we found it somewhat surprising that the, the Chinese accounts are very willing to talk about corruption at high levels, sometimes even, and this shocked us, uh, indicating you know, the most uh, system challenging frame of the rotten core where you have high level officials in core institutions of power in a fairly widespread manner, in a way you can't write off as a bad apple uh, being taken down for corruption. That frame, they're willing to go there in the Chinese press, but only if you can show justice being served, the, the bad guys getting their comeuppance. So I think that's another key narrative going on here or key driver behind this. Re uh, another one that has been mooted is that the anti-corruption campaign could be a, a, a sense of responsiveness through digital authoritarianism, seen not just as surveillance of the people having um, uh, problematic opinions, but of local governments uh, acting in a more responsive manner. I put a question mark there because I've seen no evidence that that's actually happening on the ground, that local governments are being disciplined through this action of digital authoritarianism, but it has been mooted. Uh, so a final point on this anti-corruption crackdown is that it is inherently limited in scope and in its aims, and in my opinion, it's unlikely to be transformative. So I guess I'm copping out here and, and splitting the difference of the two opinions, but let me explain. I mean, going back to that diagram, as I thought about it, what's the real model behind this campaign? The model is that there's no stepping back from the party absolutely dominating the economy, society, and all aspects of uh, socioeconomic life in China. There's no sense of that under Xi Jinping. Those arrows are powerfully pointing outward in all directions from the core executive, which is the Communist Party, and its various organs of leadership. The strategy under the anti-corruption uh, regime is to have a panopticon <laughs> at the center of that, uh, that sees everything and that polices the internal workings of the of the all dominant, all powerful party, as it uh, exercises its power. That is a very problematic proposition. There's only so far that can go. I'm not saying it, it's not a meaningful thing to do. Like if you have this system, you can catch a lot of bad guys by doing this and by strengthening the capacities to enforce it. But consider the basic problem, can the CCP control itself? China clearly has a, a state with a phenomenal infrastructural power and capacity to transform the economy, for example, undoubted. 
but can it control itself? This was a problem James Madison raised in the Federalist Papers, that the problem in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, sorry women, uh, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the government, governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. And so James Madison talks about how do you oblige the government to control itself? Uh, he noted two basic mechanisms. One is a dependence on the people, which you could read as any democratic institution, any sense of using voice, elections, or other uh, associated means. And then also he said that's not enough. Democracy itself is not enough. You need auxiliary precautions. Now, primarily, in the context of Federalist 51, that meant checks and balances, fragmentation of power. But also you could, in an anti-corruption sense, read in any measures that increase transparency, redress, uh, structural reforms, and perhaps also enforcement. But prime, what kind of enforcement would actually get you there? What you would expect to see in a successful trajectory of reforms, I believe, is that you have high level of prosecutorial actions to kick off the ball, but that over time you would see institutional approaches, meaning those kinds of checks, balances, auxiliary precautions, and increases in democratic supervision, so to speak, increasing over time to sustain the progress. I don't see that happening in the Chinese context under Xi Jinping at present. If you were looking for it, you would ask Will we see a greater weight of market forces in actual decision making? Will you see a greater firewall between the party, banks, state-owned banks especially, and uh, state-owned enterprises? And um, the answer is maybe, but you're not likely to see it before uh, the um, October uh, to, uh, National Congress uh, that's coming up. And um, you're not yet likely to see, as far as I can tell, increasing transparency recourse or a role, which I obviously misspelled, for uh, Johnstonian uh, contention in, uh, in the Xi Jinping era. So I'll close there. Basically, I'm uh, somewhat pessimistic on the potential for the anti-corruption campaign in China to really be transformative. I think it's helpful in keeping the level of corruption, given the current political economy, under some level of control while simultaneously pursuing those other objectives that Xi Jinping may be setting. I do not see it as a transformative anti-corruption strategy. And therefore, to answer Carruthers' question, should we take authoritarian anti-corruption seriously? Yes, but we should also be very skeptical about it. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes here for uh, questions, and uh, let me open the floor to anyone, and in particular, student questions are most welcome. Yes. Uh, yeah, Dean Fritzen, based on your argument, could you consider the crackdown of corruption in, re um, in authoritarian regimes to be just another expression of repression? I think, I think that's one possible lens that you have to uh, consider when you but I, I think it's also context specific. Um, does China have enough corruption at a widespread enough level so that tens of thousands in, or more officials are actually participating in corruption from which you could generate thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions uh, of cases in a legitimate anti-corruption enforcement effort? I think the answer is yes. Does that mean that every target is legitimate? That uh, the means by which it is done, um, so-called, uh, I believe it's called shuanggui, uh, or detention without uh, any uh, transparency as to what charges are being brought, people being held incommunicado, that is happening as well, and that is a fundamental abuse of power, no matter what the allegations are made. So I think the answer is yes, but it is very context specific. Uh, this one's for uh, Professor Chapman. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, with the growing uh, amount of uh, 
sanctions, uh, lack, uh, the max exodus of investment, uh, what role or how do you think this is going to affect uh, the role of oligarchs within maintaining Putin's full control of the country, especially due to the growing economic strain that, ha that, the, uh, that Russia has suffered in, uh, since the invasion of Ukraine? So the oligarchs, as I was making a point in my presentation, don't have a lot of political power. They haven't, and in recent years, they've had even less as the security services and these more hardliners have kind of come to the fore um, as being the most important people that Putin is listening to. So politically, I, they don't have as much power as many people think, um, which I believe is one of the reasons why sanctions are not necessarily going to be the most useful method of actually you know, preventing further escalation in Russia. That being said, they are the holders of some of the largest national corporations. Um, they own the energy corporations, the media, basically everything that you can think of along those lines. Um, so then in that sense, uh, they are still very important economic players. Um, so what Russia is really dealing with right now, what they're trying to figure out for themselves going forward is how can they, the economy continue to survive um, sanctions from Western countries that are oftentimes their biggest markets. Um, what they've been doing is they've been looking for alternative markets. Um, it's unclear how successful that will be, at least in the short term, when it's really hard to pivot. Um, but that's really the question I think they're asking for themselves right now. Hi, my question is also for Dr. Chapman um, in regards to the Western sanctions on Russia. What is your view um, on the perspective that the sanctions, Western sanctions, are prolonging the um, escalations in Russia and that the Russia is not taking the three-day short game but it's playing the long game in a sense that it's waiting for um, winter for Europe to feel the effects of Russian sanctions yeah. on Europe and um, assess a higher level of power in Europe and uh, get um, United States and Europe further away from each other. Yeah. So Russia has been very clear in its goals in this war. Right? They are looking for having large swaths of Ukrainian uh, land being brought into Russia. They are looking for a total change in the Ukrainian government and an establishment of a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. Um, so in that regard, it's unclear, unless it becomes very, very difficult for them to continue sustaining this war, that they would stop. I think that is something that we're unfortunately becoming to realize more and more as the war drags on. However, right now, I think Russia has both an advantage and a disadvantage when winter comes. Because on one hand, you're right, they are, um, in the past week or so, they've started kind of turning off the taps to, for natural gas to large parts of Europe. Um, this has happened before, actually in 2009, when Russia turned off the taps going to Europe. And so that they, I do think that they are hoping um, that this will make Europe a little bit more nervous um, about their lack of access to gas and try to reverse some of these sanctions in the long term so that they will be able to, you know, heat their houses. Um, however, it, winter also, uh, if they don't make gains by winter and Ukraine is continuing to making further and further gains, they're more likely to lose territory and will come to a ceasefire essentially and a standstill as the war continues to drag out, um, which means that it doesn't actually achieve its ultimate goals. So I think we're seeing both of these situations. Can I just add, to add something from the, the uh, European Union perspective, I mean, if we, we think in terms of the longer game, the fact is that what Putin has done has driven yeah. the actors in the European Union to act much faster yeah. um, and go much further in reducing dependence on mm -hmm. Russian oil and gas than anyone would have anticipated. Absolutely. And the consequence is that they are going to be gone as customers mm -hmm. permanently. Now, the question is, can they be replaced? So far, I think they are being replaced by, by other uh, customers. Um, but nonetheless, um, I, I think it's clear that the European, you know, not every country in the European Union is, Hungary, for example, continues to um, get oil and gas from Russia. And they were, that, that's the way the EU was able to agree 
to move forward with their uh, sort of cutting the, the reliance on Russian oil and gas was to, to tell Hungary, fine, you can go ahead and go your own way for a period of time. Um, but, you know, the European Union actors have, you know, have really committed. I mean, just in the last few days, the German government has nationalized um, some portions of the, the uh, oil and gas sector. Um, they've taken over companies. They plan to sell them back, put them back on the market after things you know, normalize. But, I mean, they're willing to spend money and to do what it takes to, to adjust. So I, I, I think that's, I think that's, uh, they're not going back on that. They're not going to say, we're suffering too much. We're going to relax sanctions. I can't imagine that happening. Right. Good. Thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, what is your assessment um, on the role of ideologies? Uh, in the China, um, I read that uh, now the argue that Xi Jinping uh, thoughts are part of the constitution, and and I I feel in the sense of mass media, the impact of uh, of it in terms of you know strengthening the social contract of legitimacy within the general populace, you know what do you think is the extent and the impact uh, of ideologies around sustaining in you know, authoritarian regime in China. You have two real China experts right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> they should be answering that. <laughs> Seriously. So I would love to hear what they would say. Is that okay? What do, what do you think, Bo? Uh, I wasn't entirely sure what you were asking. So... Um, First of all, a comment on Scott's uh, analysis. I think Scott has uh, uh, offered a terrific analysis on the uh, impact of the, the anti-corruption campaign over the past decade or so. I think over time, uh, looking back, a lot of analysts probably uh, are surprised how sustainable it has been over the past 10, you know, 10 years or so. And furthermore, I would contend that uh, in China, just like in Russia, uh, corruption in Russia has become a mechanism to hold the elite together. In China, anti-corruption, in a way, offers a mechanism for the state to actually uh, enhance its control, not only over the elite, but also to um, further gain uh, legitimacy. Uh, so if there was, uh, there was an election tomorrow in China, I assume that Xi Jinping actually would be elected. It just tells you how, how popular Xi Jinping is over the past decade or so. Um, and then going back to the question about ideology, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question very well, but to the extent I understand the question, I think uh, uh, under Xi Jinping's uh, you know, rule, China has pivoted to the left uh, in many, many respects. You start to hear some of the, uh, the languages during the Maoist era, for example, common prosperity, but uh, it's it's very important to recognize that there is actually a grass to le grassroots level support for that type of pivot, because China's growth has been characterized or accompanied by enormous inequality and corruption, uh, massive scale uh, systematic corruption. So Xi's campaign to uh, rule out to to you know to go after corruption, to address environmental pollution, and to push for common prosperity is immensely popular. So in that sense, you know, uh, at the elite level, there, there is a lot of frustration that he's changing the norms and, and the rules that have been created over the, you know, ever since 19, uh, the 1980s. Uh, nevertheless, the, the, at the grassroots level, and people don't even really care about whether he stays for another five years or so, whether he, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, the constitution uh, has been changed, although it's important to recognize the party constitution, if you look at the party constitution, there is never a limit on uh, how long you can be the leader in that sense, right? So uh, I'm not sure if I un answered your question, right? And so what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, uh, first, the, 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 the CCP regime has really enhanced its control over the past uh, decade also on the Xi and the the anti-corruption campaign, as Scott has mentioned, uh, probably will not uh, root out the systematic corruption because you know there is a political economy side of it that is 
if you look at how the public officials are paid, a big proportion of their the wages uh, the fr in, in the form of fringe benefits come from site money. <laughs> and the site money oftentimes comes through the, the access money or the transfers, right? So in that sense, it's not going to be transformative. Miriam, you have anything to uh, I'll try, but I'm not, I, as I say, I'm not, do you want to <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, I, got I mean, what I, what I would say, is, and sort of building off of what um, uh, Bo said, um, is that the, the, the degree of inequality in China for the common person and the sort of flatlining or even going down of normal people's life possibilities is extreme. And, um, and that sense of powerlessness combined with the, with, the, with the people who have no expectation of political voice. So it's not that you, you wish you had a voice so you could change things. You've never had a voice. It's, it's inconceivable that you would have the power to change those weather systems moving across the space. And so your only hope is if the center takes control and brings things back into a moment of equity. The farther people have come from the Maoist era, the more they dream of it as a remembered space when there was much greater equity in society, when there was much greater resourcing for the common person, where elites couldn't get out of control, where immorality and a sense that the nation has lost its soul which people have increasingly felt in the reform era, that all of those things were in a sort of puritanical society. I think people who are older and remember it more closely have less of a dreamy view. But Xi Jinping is pulling those golden memories and saying, I'm going to bring us back to that safe, moral, uh, directed society, which is much more equitable. And I'm going to do it through patterns that are going to feel strikingly similar to the Maoist era, including reconstructing Xi Jinping thought and having everyone learn it. But you know, it may seem silly, but it worked in the Maoist era. And look at what kind of harmonious society, create a less harmonious society, you can't believe. But that's when you feel that there is this sense, as people see more corruption, but also as they see more citizens who do things that are untenable from a moral sense, that the whole society has lost its moral anchor. Who's going to bring us back to being real human beings? And Xi Jinping is saying, I'm going to transform the society, but I'm going to make not just Chinese people great, but I'm going to make them morally, really Chinese true beings and a moral society. And that's very appealing when Can you we feel now, the whole uh, thing is off. I'm, I'm very sorry. Can we take one more question? Because I know there are people who have good things to say, and then after uh, we break up, certainly those conversations can't We continue. have two here, and that's okay, and then we make the two of them and... and Okay, if you can, we can do that fairly quickly because we're running out of time. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to insist on the point that I made, uh, made earlier this morning because I see that a lot of times in the presentations we circle back to, let's say, the liberal ideals, right? The remedy for corruption is to, uh, if not adopt, but let grow those liberal institutions, separations of po separation of powers and so on. And uh, again, one thing that I see that, that's puzzling both about democratic decline and about uh, corruption is that a lot of times both uh, happen through uh, the adoption and the manipulation of, of liberal institutions. So the example that I should have given this morning is free speech. I was talking to Michael about this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's free speech rights, which is a very liberal idea and which we all think is going to be an antidote to corruption, is precisely what enables corruption in the uh, uh, U.S. system, the kind of one of the types of corruption that Michael talks about, uh, which is behind Citizens United, corporations donating a lot of money to candidates 
as free speech, right? So I just wonder if, if, if we should um, still be taking that extra step that we all take in the presentations to advocate for liberal institutions, or if we should you know, expand our imagination in terms of how uh, po uh, politics and, and governance should be organized. Sorry. <laughs> There is the old rule that no good deed ever goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> the final question. Uh, my question is for Dr. Smith. Given the recent situation and in the past days that we've seen the EU has moved a vote to cut billions of dollars worth of funding to Hungary, what do you, sir, believe would be a realistic outcome for you know Hungary? It's difficult to say how the population will react because I myself look at Hungary quite often being, you know, originated from that area of Europe. I have friends in Hungary who, you know, live there actively and tell me what goes on, but we don't fully know how the population feels. Of course, you know, we saw the election results a few months ago. I think we all know very well that's kind of a false representation of how the population views Orban. So what do you think could be a realistic outcome, you know, could it be social movement? I don't want to be extreme and throw the word regime change, but we never use that in the media when discussing a country in the EU, whereas the moment it's somewhere in the East, we love to throw it around. No, I, I think the uh, first question was not for me. No, no, no. <laughs> well, right, I'll, I'll just I'll address it. You should ignore it as well. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I'll, I'll try to address that as, as best I can. Um, you know, I don't think there is... You know, just as we heard in, in in Russia, you know, there's not an obviously sort of happy outcome to this story. I think that it's hard to imagine what that looks like for Hungary, too, because every time the European Union has taken a step to try and call Orban to account, Orban has very effectively used that to his benefit. I mean, he's he's developed this model, you know, where he has placed himself as the defender of, um, I mean, it's is a Christian nationalist movement that he has created. I mean, he calls it that himself. That's what it is. Um, and, and he's defined that as Hungary's national identity. Um, if you're not part of, you know, uh, that, that first slide I showed, I don't know if I said this, but what it said was Hungary first. Um, and so he, and, and some of the people carrying uh, banners at those marches uh, are saying things like that, that all true Hungarians are with us. So when we think about, you know, the population, it's, it's deeply divided. You know, when, when you um, suggest that the electoral outcome was not an accurate reflection, well, I mean, uh, I can't remember what the share of the, the, share of the vote that, that Orban's party got was in the, in the 40s, I believe. So it's not a majority, majoritarian party, but it is the single largest party. And I think that does reflect the divisions that he has created in Hungarian society. And I'm just not sure whether the withholding of EU funds and the very narrow way in which it's been defined are going to be enough to really break that apart because um, his formula, is, is a, his nationalist formula is a very successful one. And I think there's a lot of incentives for other leaders to emulate that. We, we've seen a lot of it. So um, it's a very dangerous time. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that, but, but you know, it's dangerous, I think. Is there a next step, potentially, you know, the EU? Well, there, there are, so I'll, I'll just try and be brief. I know we're running out of time, but, you know, I've, I showed in, very quickly in a slide the, this Article 7 procedure, which is, which enables countries to potentially suspend the voting rights of a member state in the council. So that means that, that they can't kick Hungary out of the European Union. There's no mechanism for doing that. But they can suspend their voting rights. That would be a big deal, but it requires unanimity of all the member states. And, and, and what the EU, other in, the, the EU institutions need to do is to begin to drive a wedge between Poland and Hungary. To some extent, the war in Ukraine is doing that, and because uh, the Polish government is not happy with the fact that Orban continues to support the Russian government. So there is some possibility of returning to that process and suspending their voting rights. I think we're still a long way from getting there, but that would be a pretty potent punishment, although taking away funds is probably even more meaningful. This has been an excellent discussion, and I think it could run on for quite some time. Perhaps it will in uh, conversations among yourselves. But will you join me in appreciating our panelists? And thank you.
i hope that we can continue these conversations in many ways. thank you very much.